Hey, this morning, I get, to, uh, I get to talk out loud about a subject with which I have had considerable experience. I can't say that about many things, but this morning, I can. We're going to be talking about a four-letter word that's in the Bible 109 times. Are you ready for it? Wait. That's the word. Wait. I have had considerable experience in my life waiting for the numbers of many prodigals to return. And I think I'm probably in good company. And uh, when I speak of prodigals, I'm not only talking about our children. Certainly that's the story that we're going to read from Luke 15 in just a few minutes. But uh, I'm talking about the other kinds of prodigals that we have in our lives too. Those who we know, who've walked with the Lord, and maybe walked away. And so let's expand the subject matter, okay, so that everybody can be included in this conversation this morning. All of us know someone who's maybe distanced themselves from the Lord this morning. And uh, so keep them in mind, along with the parents who may even have a prodigal child. And so as we, we think about them, let's think about this. We're picking up where we left off two weeks ago. We're in Luke chapter 15. You can turn there in your Bibles if you would. And uh, what we're going to actually be talking about is uh, the father waiting for the son and how well he did it. And I've learned a great deal from the example of the dad of the prodigal. And so that's what I'd like for us to talk about this, this morning a little while. And uh, if you guys will turn to the next slide there. This is a, a friend of mine uh, posted, posted this. Courtney Munson is an Aggie graduate, and she was our intern at Sam Houston State University for a year, and she's in uh, Dallas Theological Seminary now. Her parents live on a ranch in Brownwood, and she was there. She's there now for her summer break, and she took this picture off of the balcony uh, of, their, up, of the upstairs in, in their house there at the, uh, at the ranch. And I don't know, that picture looks a whole lot better on my computer screen than it does there. But, you know, it's the dog waiting for the rains to quit. And uh, we're going to talk about rains in a minute, but you're going to have to wait for it. So we'll even practice waiting here in the next few minutes. But this is what she posted. When it's been raining for days and you dream of adventures. And so we've all had a version of that uh, the last few weeks, waiting to be able to go on with the adventure after the rain. But... This depicts what I see in my heart and I see in my mind as I read this story about the prodigal son, the prodigal father at home waiting, but waiting with anticipation, looking down the driveway, watching for his son to return. And let's go ahead and read that story together. Put that up on the screen too from uh, Luke chapter 15. Maybe you think we're going to be stuck in Luke till Jesus comes back. Uh, or stuck in Luke 15 even until Jesus comes back. And if we do get stuck there, it would be a pretty good place to be stuck anywhere. Anyway, but uh, I'd like for us to read this story together. It's very familiar to you. And then we'll go back and look at a couple of the key points here. But just looking at the example, this fantastic example of a father who waited well. Read along with me, okay? Luke chapter 15, I'll begin at verse 20, and it goes like this. But while he was still... A long way off. His father saw him. He was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, this is the speech that his son had been practicing. Father, I have sinned against heaven against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he interrupts the speech. But the father said to him, quick. Get that word quick. Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. I picture him barefooted. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast. That's what we're going to do in a few minutes. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to, and there's that word again, celebrate. What a great story. Some of us have already had this experience, and some of us are still in a part of the story that starts, that's still going on before verse 20. We're still waiting, 
still waiting for a prodigal in our lives to return. And uh, we'll learn a, bit, a little bit about waiting. You'll get to benefit from my experiences there. Let's go back up there. While he was still a long way off, go ahead and go to the next slide. I've underlined a few statements here that i like for us not to miss. The sun was still a long way off. What does that, what does that indicate to me? It says the father was waiting with expectation. He just knew this day was going to come. And that's why he was sitting on the front porch waiting and watching. He was watching so closely that when the sun was even a long way off still, he recognized his form. And no doubt the sun looked different than he he did when he left. Like I said, I picture him barefooted. He had lost everything. He had squandered. He had wasted. You know, the word prodigal doesn't mean wayward. Prodigal means wasting extravagantly just to waste the opportunity or to waste the resources or to race to waste giftedness and how many of us have watched a friend or a son or a dad or another family member waste the giftedness that they've been giving that's what prodigal means to waste extravagantly and that's what the prodigal had been doing But uh, let's see here. Go on to the next slide that has the underlined. Is that up there, Bruce? No? It's something else? Okay, is it stuck? I get stuck sometimes. But uh, okay, let's let's see. When the son came back, the father said to his servants, look at that word, that great word, quick. He was so ready for his son to return that he had even made preparations beforehand. But he didn't make the son grovel. He didn't say, okay, wait a minute, I need to hear your apology, because he had greatly offended his dad, hadn't he? He had wasted tremendous resources, but he didn't make him grovel. And even before he expressed, began to express that speech that he had rehearsed back in the pig pen, when he began his, even before he began his speech, his dad said, quick, he said, let's get all these things ready. Put, put a robe on him. I understand. I, I pictured the young man in tattered clothing. It had pig manure on it. And he smelled like the pigs. And he kissed him. He said, put a ring on his finger. What does the ring indicate? Sonship. He had a ring already for his son to return. He said, put shoes on his feet. He had even walked out of his shoes. He came back destitute. But his dad didn't make him grovel. And he was able to forgive him even before the apology was made. How can you do that? Those who have been forgiven much, forgive much. And it's because we've been forgiven. Because the son knew what forgiveness was from the father, he was able to express the forgiveness of the father to his son even before the apology was made. How many times have we felt? Not until he apologizes. Not going to forgive him. We're holding out. We're waiting. No, 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 no. You know, we've been forgiven much, and so we can forgive much. Even before the apology is made, that's what the Father did. My goodness. And then, look what they did. Celebrate. The word appears twice. As extravagantly as the son had wasted his resources, the dad matched it by extravagant celebration. He celebrated extravagantly, even in light of the offense that had been committed. So welcome. Welcome home. No conditions, no apology, already welcome. Man, that speaks to me. I think of it all the time. But think of the preparation, the long-term preparation. He waited in such anticipation that guess what? They fatted a calf. That takes a while. You've got to be saying, okay, I'm acting on faith. My son is going to return someday. And when he does, the calf is going to be ready. And he fatted the calf. And the calf was already ready. And quick, they had this celebration and the party. But it's in that gap before the homecoming. It's in that gap that I would like for us to think about and to focus on 
this morning for a little while. Bruce, is the PowerPoint going to work? If we can go to that next slide. There it is. Do you trust me when my answer is to wait? We just keep on trusting. Because frankly, some of us are still waiting, aren't we? Not having a chance to have that party yet. We could have the fatted calf ready and the ring and the robe and the shoes. But we don't have a chance to have that party. We have not had a chance to have that party yet. We're still waiting. Here's what C.S. Lewis said. Life with God is not immunity from difficulties, but peace in the difficulties. Draw the contrast. The previous two stories before the story of the lost son, the story was about the lost sheep, about the lost coin. And in each of those cases, there was this frantic search. I mean, forget everything else. Everybody come help me. Let's go on a search. It's a frantic search. But then the third of the stories that Jesus tells in this series of the kingdom of God, what it's like, the lost the importance of the lost ones, this one contrasts. There's no frantic search going on. It's a patient wait. And each of those, those is important, are they not? And uh, it's as important when it's time to frantically search and to frantically pursue that we pursue with all of our hearts. But it's equally important that we wait peacefully when this is the word that we have from God. Wait. Wait well. That's the title of the message this morning, Waiting Well. Jeremiah 31, 25 puts it this way. God is the one who makes it well with your soul when it is not well with your circumstances. Peace, even before. I'd like to say one more thing, just parenthetically. Um, I, I would guess, you know, those of us who are of age have friends in our lives who have had a prodigal son or daughter. And you know what the first fear of a father and a mother is when their son or daughter goes stray? You know what the first fear is that they have? That everybody thinks poorly of them. Oh no. What are my friends going to think? They're going to think I was a bad parent. It's the first fear they have. And you know what that fear often causes them, causes us to do? Just lay low. We can't even talk about it. We can't even invoke the prayers of our friends for the lost one because we're so afraid that they will just condemn us for being a poor parent. You know, let's all just agree that when a friend of ours has a kid who goes stray, let's don't blame them, okay? Let's don't blame them. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but kids are not remote control. <laughs> There is no remote control. And they get out of range real easy. They get out of range real fast. And so when a kid begins to make poor choices, guess whose fault it is? It's the kid's fault. It's not the parent's fault. Think of it. How many parents do you know have two or more kids? And their kids are an expression of this huge contrast. One kid soars. He flies. He accomplishes. Everything goes great for him or her. And then within the same family, same parents, same food at the table, oftentimes two brothers sleeping in the same room, and one of them goes stray. Is that the parent's fault when the kid strays? No. When a kid starts making poor choices, it's the kid's fault. But you don't just fault him. You join the mother and the dad. Give them the grace not to be embarrassed because they cannot take responsibility for their mostly grown kids' actions. Not their fault. But we sure can come alongside them. We can pray. We can pray with them. We can wait patiently with them. That's what we need, isn't it? Wait patiently with them. They need wait partners. So let's, let's just agree. Next time you hear of a friend whose kid has gone stray, our commitment to each other is that we will not blame you. And the only parents in the room who have not had a kid to stray yet are the parents of very young children. 
Everybody else has had some version of this story that they have in their lives. Well, uh, I came up, you know, I had a lot of time to think about this one for two weeks. This has been stewing in my head. And so I went back and I said, considering the considerable experience that I've had waiting for prodigals, I said, God, what are some of the things that you have taught me along the way? Because I'm, I'm going to not take credit for it, but I'm going to be quick to tell you, I, uh, I'm a lot better waiter than I used to be. I, I can wait pretty well now. And it's a gift from God, because I've known what it's like not to be able to wait well and to fret. I'm a world-class fretter. But uh, do you know John Piper? He's one of the current Christian authors, especially the college kids read a lot of and hear a lot of from him. He was in a panel discussion one time, room full of parents. And uh, just questions are open for anybody. What are your questions? And one of the parents spoke up, had the nerve to do it. With that feeling that everybody in the room would condemn him or her. The parent said, what do you do when your kid goes prodigal? And he was real quiet. In his response, he said, don't freak out. What a good word. Don't freak out. That would be spoken by a man who knew what it's like to be able to look at those two choices. Am I going to freak out or not? And he said, don't freak out. Rings with authority, doesn't it? And uh, let's see, somebody, I give this one to Deb. She posted this. And and let me just tell you, I don't read your Facebook pictures and then come up with a message that comes out of them. I'm already working on the message, but sometimes it's uncanny. How many times you post stuff that says, that goes with what I'm thinking about already. And Deb posted this. You're going to discover that worrying has no transformational value. Worrying is rehearsing the very things you don't want to happen. And we give credit to Michael Bernard Beckwith for saying that. So, just a rehearsal of all the bad things that you don't hope don't happen. Worrying. Don't worry. I remember the day the reason I remember the day is because I wrote it down on a little card. And I carry a bunch of little cards in my right back pocket all the time. It's conformed to my image. See that? And uh, I, I write down verses on little cards. When God speaks to me, say, I need that one. I need that one more for just like reading it and shut the Bible and go and forget about it. I write them down a little card. And this is one of the verses I wrote down one day. God spoke clearly to me. It's from John 4, verses 49 and 50. The royal official had a son who was sick. He was scared to death. He was fretting. He was worried about his son. He goes up to Jesus and said, Sir, come down before my child dies. That's how worried he was. Jesus said, listen to this. It's in effect John Piper's words. Don't fret. He said, you may go. Your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and left. He chose not to fret. He said, okay. He took Jesus at his word and went on. And one of the ways that we express our confidence in God when we have the choice to fret or not to fret, I think is illustrated in this next picture. And I asked Fernanda for permission to show this picture of little Camelia. She just left. (laughs) She just left the room. Uh... What a great picture of not fretting. I don't think little Camila Marie is fretting about a thing in that picture. And I look at that picture and I say, God, let me sleep like that. As an expression of my trust in you, I'm not going to fret. I'm going to do what the man did when Jesus told him, you may go, your son will live. He took him at his word and he rested. He didn't fret. He rested, took Jesus as word. And I can too. I can't tell you how many times I laid down in my bed at night. Thousands, I'm confident, thousands. And the first thing that came to my mind when I laid my head on my pillow was Psalm 27, 14. It says this, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He'll strengthen your heart. Wait 
I say, on the Lord. Thousands of times I laid my head on the pillow and let God speak peace to me so that I could do that. Wait on the Lord. Psalm 27, 14, it'll do you good. It's done me a whole lot of good. Psalm uh, uh, 27, 14, uh, Psalm 5, 3 says this, In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you. And then get this last part. And wait in expectation. Not only do we lay the weight on the table before the Lord, but then we're expectant like the father who's looking down the road, saw his son from a very long way away. So, first point, don't freak out. Don't freak out. The next point, I need a volunteer. Pete, would you be my volunteer? Thank you for so enthusiastically responding to my request. Come, come this way. I'm going to stand on the step so I won't look so short beside you. Uh, now I'm sh- nervous. Yeah, shake hands with me. You've done that before. No, no, no. Yeah, okay. Like that, huh? I want you to let go. What happened? You didn't let go. I didn't let go, did I? No, sir. No. No, sir. And you could, you could try to take run off down that aisle, couldn't you? You know what? What? You dragged me with you. Because <laughs> I'm not letting go. Amen. I'm not going to let go. Okay. Okay, everybody, that's exactly what God does. When you and I made our commitment to him, wait a second. When you and I made our commitment to him and we said, okay, Lord, I'm putting my hands in yours. Okay. This is the way he grabbed us. Okay. And if we let go, he doesn't. He won't let go. John 10, 28 and 29. Baptist God, thank you. You did great. Awesome. Good job. Uh, Baptist, thank you, Pete. Baptists have a, a doctrine that we really hold dear. It's called the security of the believer. Have you ever heard that before? And it, the, other t- the other way we put it is we say, once saved, always. Why is that? Because if we let go, Jesus doesn't let go. Okay, for all of you who have a child, or a neighbor, or a brother, or a parent who's let go of God, here's the confidence that we can have. God's not going to let go of them. Psalm 139, some weeks ago, we talked about that in the morning. What does it say? If I went up to heaven, you would be there. If I lay down in the world of the dead, you would be there with me. If I went, flew away as far as the east is from the west, you'd be there to lead me. You'd be there to help me. How's that happen? He won't let go. It's based on this verse from John. John 10, 20, 20 and others as well. It says... Uh, Get the promise. I give them eternal life. What kind of life? Eternal life. That means it doesn't stop. I give them eternal life. And then the promise goes on. And they will never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. It can't be done. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Now, is that good or what? You know what? There's no provision in the gospel for unfathering. No provision. When that commitment is made, it's called a covenant. It's a covenant between two people. Even as a child, when I committed my life to the Lord... I didn't know anything about the Lord. I didn't know what it meant to follow Him. I just took a little step that a kid would take. But you know what? He knew all about covenant. And He grabbed me by the wrist. And the times that I've let Him go, know what? He didn't let me go. So there's a great deal of confidence that I draw from that. And it's rooted in Scripture itself. 
And so your children, you know why? You know why we have Vacation Bible School? Thank you, Roy, for the plug. You know why we have Vacation Bible School? Is because Del Rio is filled with kids who, given the opportunity to hear the gospel, they'll respond to the gospel. And the gift of the gospel is called eternal life. It counts. counts what we do for these kids. It counts for eternity what we do for them. And then their parents, when they watch their kids go on their prodigal detours, go back to John 10, verse 28 and 29. God won't let go. You know what? My son couldn't come to me and say, Dad, un undad me. <laughs> Good luck with that. It ain't going to happen. And why is that? Well, part of it's because of the example that I read in the prodigal. His father is... But the better example is the one that I have from the Father. The way that I know how to be a father is I have one. I have a good one. He teaches me how to do this. You know what? Those are just two of the points that I wanted to make this morning. Don't freak out. And number two, God won't let go. He won't let go. Don't freak out. God won't let go. And I'm going to stop there, and you're going to have to wait <laughs> till next Sunday, and we'll finish this one up, okay? Because, uh, you know, if there is one parent in the room today waiting for a prodigal return, it's worth all of us visiting these things with him so that he or she may wait well. And us too, those of us who have other versions of prodigals in our life to wait well.